Okay. Uh, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this day that you have blessed us with. Father, we pray that uh, as we uh, uh, study today, Father, let it be your wisdom that guides us. We pray that uh, uh, you bless Pastor Deepika with uh, 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 all the wisdom that she needs to teach us. We, we pray that you prepare our hearts to receive what is in store for us today. Uh, learn and ponder over it and strengthen our spirits uh, into the new dimensions, Lord. We thank you and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. So uh, before we get into today's uh, session, um, there was a small glitch in the assessment which was put up uh, you know, in the Google Classroom. Uh, but the settings have been reset. So uh, I'm assuming that now there should be no more issues. I think you will be able to access the final assessment and you know, do those multiple choice questions. Um, if you're able to tackle maybe about 10 questions per day, uh, you should be able to finish in time. Uh, you know, so you know, it's just think of it as you know, having to tick uh, 10 answers per day. I mean, of course, you have other subjects as well and those assessments as well. Uh, but uh, my hope is that uh, if you just do about 10 questions per day for John, uh, you should be able to you know, complete uh, within the time limit. Uh, so yeah, that was just regarding. And you have any other questions regarding that? You know, you can always raise questions during the class today. A anything regarding the final assessment? Um, or any other doubts regarding the class because you know we have only one class left we have today's class and uh, we have next week of course so we have uh, finished with first john chapters one and two uh, so today we will uh, look at all the other three remaining chapters in the first epistle um, so we will begin with first john chapter three today um, if someone could read out for us just verse 1. We'll reflect on verse 1 and then continue from there. First uh, John chapter 3, verse 1. If someone could read out for us, please. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Yeah. Uh, so we, as we read this entire epistle, we need to keep in mind why this particular letter is being written. He is writing with a very specific purpose. Uh, wrong teachings have come into the church. Uh, there are this one section of the church uh, which has, you know, um, uh, gone out. Uh, from the community. Uh, now they formed a separate group group, and they're making allegations and saying, uh, you know, you Christians, you're not actually Christians. We are the true Christians. We are the ones who have received this special mysterious knowledge from the Lord. Uh, so uh, we are the chosen of God. Uh, now you others, uh, you know, the in, you don't have this kind of mysterious uh, Gnostic knowledge which we have received. So uh, the believers are uh, confused. The, um, these people who are making allegations seem so superior, so knowledgeable, so intellectual. Uh, and they're speaking of all these mysterious um, uh, spirit experiences that they are having. Um, and they're making um, statements regarding Jesus himself about how he was not fully human and all of that. So they're confused. So um, throughout the letter, uh, it is this issue which is being addressed. So we have to keep that in mind, uh, you know, and not uh, read other meanings into this entire epistle. So here, when we see uh, the very first verse of chapter three, um, here uh, John is assuring these believers and telling them, "See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are." So here they are wondering. Oh, are we really the true believers? Because these people who seem to know so much, they're saying things about us. They're saying that we don't have any kind of special, mysterious knowledge. And they're saying that we are not really part of uh, you know, Jesus' flock. Uh, uh, so even as they're worrying about that, uh, this letter is being given to them. And John is assuring them and saying, you know, you are greatly loved by the Father. You are so greatly loved by the Father that he regards you as his uh, own adopted children. Okay, so 
um, he again re-emphasizes what he is saying and he says that is what we are. So never doubt that. Uh, never doubt the status that you have in him. So while these fake Christians, these Gnostic Christians were um, saying that they are the elite, the superior ones, he says, actually, it is you people who are children of the living God. You're the, you're the you know, uh, true children. Uh, so you're the elite. And if you are the children of God, then, you know, there's nothing higher than that. Uh, and uh, so he assures them of their position and security in the Lord. And uh, uh, then he goes on to say, the reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. So uh, these people, these fake Christians, they are in fact part of the world. Uh, they are not even part of the true church. And... Uh, they have never really known him, you know, because that he may, he refers to that. Uh, we saw that in the in, in the previous uh, uh, class. They, if they had really belonged to us, you know, they would have remained with us. But the fact that they left and they went out talking about a different doctrine, it shows that in the uh, that even in the beginning itself, they never really made a true commitment. If they had made a true commitment, if they had, uh, you know, uh, based their faith on the true revelation then they would have had a uh, experience of the holy spirit the holy spirit would have you know made them into a new creation he would have given them a brand new spirit now none of those things happened to these people they came into the church they pretended as if though they are part of the church and then uh, they got uh, led away into these new doctrines and they left the church so they were in fact never really part of the church and they are part of the world and here he assures and says uh, they they um do not accept what we are saying simply because they do not know him the way we know him we on the other hand are children of god and we have been we have a personal relationship with god so he assures the christians and says you know do not be shaken by what is being said uh, you are part of god's family and you are the true elite okay so that's the assurance that he is um, giving them um Yes, this is First John chapter three, and we looked at verse one. Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. So, if someone could read out for us verse two. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him because we shall see him as he is amen yes so here it says um now okay right now dear friends now we are children of god and what we will be in the future that is has not yet been made known but we know that when christ appears we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is uh, so John is making a differentiation um, between what we are now and what we are going to be later. What does he mean? He says that right now uh, our status is that we are God's children. Uh, but he says what, are, what we are going to be in the future, that is not known. Uh, what could he mean by that? Obviously, he does not mean that we will stop being God's children, right? Uh, I mean, once you're part of the family, you are part of the family. So the Lord would never you know, reject us and say, okay, now you're no longer children. So he's obviously not talking about that. So what is this other thing that we are going to be in the future, which is not known now? What is he talking about? Um, if you see, um, uh, one fact that he brings out is that we don't know the details of what we will be later, but we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. So uh, that that's one thing which he clarifies. We will definitely be like him. That much is very, very clear. So maybe we can you know, just uh, talk about that aspect, and then we'll move to the other part of the question. Uh, so um, when, we, when he appears, we shall be like him, because you know we will know him the way he is. Uh, now, what does this mean? Uh, it's talking about how when we see Jesus Christ with our own eyes, um, at that time, we will see what exactly being like Christ really is. Right now, we have a good idea based on the scriptures of uh, who Jesus is, uh, what his character is, 
uh, what he stands for. Uh, but then when we literally see him with our own eyes and we begin to interact with him physically, then we would know uh, to a greater extent the depth of his love. We would know the the you know uh, the the extent of his faithfulness. We would know the very depths of how humble humility actually is meant to be. Uh, we would see uh, you know the, the 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 greatness of his justice uh, and power. So we would actually literally see um, the outer extents, the outer boundaries and limits of who he is, because right now, you know, in our minds and our human limitedness, we may not be able to comprehend the bigness of this Jesus. And uh, we cannot be as humble as he is because we still do not even know what humility is. When we see him, they will think, my, this is the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And look at him. He's so humble. So this is humility. We will see with our eyes and we will understand what the standard of humility is that has been set for us. And then on that day, we would begin to move into those things. We would be like him. We would be uh, like him in humility. We would be like him in our faithfulness. Uh, we would be uh, like him in, 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 in the way we regard justice and fairness uh, uh, and all of that. Uh, so right now, the picture that we have of him uh, is still incomplete. We think we understand what humility is. We think what faithfulness is. But when we look at him, then we will know that this is the extent of what these things stand for. And on that day, uh, we will you know, then choose to go up to that standard, to go up to that level, because we would, of course, desire to imitate him and be like him. Okay, So we do know that when we see him, we will um, you know, be like him. But it also talks about another aspect where it says, right now we are children. What we will be has not yet been made known to us. So I am assuming that most probably this refers to, uh, you know, um, something similar which Paul said in his uh, writings. So Galatians 4. Uh, one to seven. I know that's a huge chunk of seven verses, but it really helps us. It really throws light on what you know is being said over here in First uh, John uh, three, where it says, uh, "What we will be has not yet been made known." What is he talking about? What is he referring to? If someone could read out Galatians chapter four, verses one to seven, and you know if we can really kind of apply our minds to what it's what it's saying over here about what we will be and it's not being fully known now so you know think about it even as this passage is being read out galatians 4 1 to 7 think about yeah, what I mean, implications this passage can have for you know what we are going to be reflecting upon yes please go ahead galatians chapter 4 1 to 7 what i am saying is that as long as the uh, as the air uh, uh, is a minor he is no different from a slave even though he is the legal owner of the estate, rather he is subject to guardians and caretakers until the time previously set by his father. So it is with us. When we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirits of the universe. But when the appointed time arrived, God sent forth his son. He was born from a woman, born into a culture in which legalistic perversion of the Torah was known, so that he might redeem those in subjection to this legalism and thus enable us to be made God's son. Now, because you are sons, because you are sons, God has sent forth into our hearts the spirit of his son, the spirit who cries, Abba, that is their father. So true God, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, you are also an heir. Yes. So Paul begins by saying, that once upon a time, before earlier, before we you know came into the Lord's family, before we made a commitment to the Lord Jesus, uh, we were slaves. 
because uh, it was these elemental spiritual forces that controlled us. We were under Satan's control. We were under the control of his demons. We had this uh, sinful spirit inside us. Uh, you know, and so we were living in sin. And because we were living in sin, we were under the control of the evil spirits. And uh, we could not set ourselves free on our own. We were in that pathetic condition. But once we came uh, to Jesus and made a commitment to him, he set us free. So uh, uh, we who were slaves became free. And not only did we become free, we actually became uh, children of God. And we became heirs uh, to a great spiritual inheritance, which God has you know, waiting for us. But he also makes another point. He says that as long as that heir is still you know, in a, a minor, um, he does not inherit that full inheritance. Uh, so he's just like uh, the slaves in the house. Now, of course, when we think of a slave, we think of someone shackled and in chains or you know, uh, working out in the, uh, in the open fields and he's being whipped and um, he's in a very pathetic condition and he has absolutely no rights or privileges. Uh, that is the kind of image that we have of a slave. Uh, because of the kind of horrible slavery that uh, you know uh, was going on in the uh, USA in, in, in those days. Uh, but before that, in biblical times, a slave was uh, not something uh, uh, terrible um, because uh, slaves held positions of great importance and authority you know, in, in big households. Uh, they would be like the administrators. Uh, there would be people who are you know carrying out uh, uh, important responsibilities so um, the master of the house would uh, shell out a lot of money uh, to buy a valuable slave you know someone who with skills and talents and then he would train him up he would invest in him train him up uh, so that he can take those positions of responsibility in his household you know in his business uh, so Slaves were not really um, anything inferior. Of course, you also had the menial slaves who would be made to do physical labor and all of that. But there were many slaves who were in good positions. So um, um, this minor, who is uh, the inherit, uh, you know, who who will be receiving his inheritance one day? This young boy who's like you know running around the house and is still a minor. He's not yet a grown up. His status would be like that of the slave who's running the household. In the sense, uh, the slave has no inheritance of his own, uh, nor does this uh, boy who is running around in the house still have any inheritance. But one day, uh, his father would have set a time. It says that in, in verse 2, Galatians 4, verse 2. On the day when the father has set the time, on that day, this boy would be, be grown up enough, and the father will you know, put his signature and say, now onwards. This inheritance is your, your is yours, and on that day, the status of this boy automatically increases beyond that of the slave. Uh, the slave is still, you know, running matters, but now this boy is going to be the boss of that slave. Uh, you know, rather than the slave giving him orders and taking care of him and being his guardian, now this boy who has, you know, uh, reached manhood and the inheritance has been turned over to him, he will be in authority. And in fact, the slave would be taking orders from him in the future. So things kind of change in the household at that point of time. Uh, so when it's uh, when John is speaking over here about what we, we still do not know about what we are going to be in the future, he is probably speaking about this. Right now, we are just sons. Um, Right now, we are heirs, uh, and uh, we have not yet entered into the full inheritance that we are meant to have. But when we see him, we will be like him, and we will be ready for this new role that God has for us. So all those details have not been revealed to us. We know that there will be a new heaven and a new earth. We know that we will have some kind of role to play over there in that new kingdom. Uh, but the details of what exactly we will be, uh, what our role will be, uh, the, the powers and privileges which will be given to us, uh, those things have not been revealed to us as yet. Uh, all we do know is that when it comes to character, we will uh, begin to be like him, completely like Jesus. That much we know. Uh, now, what privileges and responsibilities will go with that um, new, uh, you know, new character? 
that is something that will be revealed to us only in the future so um, these are some of the things that we could you know um, apply over here to, to this particular uh, verse in when we are trying to understand it um, uh, if we can also just look at second uh, corinthians 3 16 to 18 if someone could read out second corinthians chapter 3 16 to 18 please second corinthians chapter 3 verse 16 to 18 but when one turns to the lord the veil is removed now the lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the lord is there is freedom and we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another for this comes from the lord who is the spirit in it. Yes. So here uh, it talks about how even while we are here on this earth, even now as we are fellowshipping with him, even as you know uh, we are spending time with him, even now itself that transformation has already started. We are already becoming more and more like him. But uh, the process has not been completed. And that is why it says in 1 Corinthians 13 verse 12, it says, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. So on that day, when we know all that is required, you know, we, we will know it fully. Um, you know, uh, because now we are, uh, you know, Jesus says we are no longer slaves, but we are his friends. And he's being to re beginning to reveal to us all uh, the matters regarding his father's business. Now, one, when we step into this new life, you know, into, into the new heaven and the new earth, at that time, we will be given even more details regarding the father's business. So we will know fully. Um, we will be like Christ and we will also know everything more fully. At that time, we will be ready to take on the new responsibilities that come with the inheritance. So there are very great, grand things awaiting the believer. And this is the time when we can prepare ourselves for it. If we waste away these years, uh, you know, uh, on that day, um, we may not be able to actually get into what was originally planned for us, we would just be given maybe something lesser because we simply never even prepared ourselves for it. So now is the time to build up the relationship with him. Now is the time to, you know, um, to, to really understand his heart and do his father's business to the extent that we know it today. Uh, because even as we uh, get into these things and prove ourselves as very, very faithful, on that day, he will say, no, well done, faithful servant. And then he would, you know, it says that we would be given greater things, greater responsibilities. So, um, you know, so we could understand this in uh, along the lines of, um, you know, these principles. All right. Uh, if someone could read out for us uh, verse 3. It's just a short verse. If someone could read out for us, verse 3. Is anyone there? Okay. I, can, yeah. I can go ahead. Yes. So uh, first John, first John or first first Corinthians. Oh no, no, okay. First John chapter three, verse three. Okay, first three, okay. And everyone who has this hope in him continues purifying himself since god is pure okay so um those of us who really have this hope that one day we will be like him and this thing means something to us we value this we treasure this that we are going to be like him if that thing is something precious to us then we will start that process of becoming like him today itself. We will not have the attitude uh, that, OK, one day I'll anyway become like him. So right now, while I'm here, let me you know enjoy my life of sin. We will not even have that attitude because we are looking forward to what we will become. We long for that. And so we begin that process now itself you know, with the help of the Holy Spirit. And uh, 
that is the difference between uh, people who genuinely have become born again Christians and those who are just part of the Christian community simply because it has been handed down to them as tradition. Uh, so um, those who have become a new creation on the inside, those who have been given a new spirit uh, by, you know, by, by the Holy Spirit, uh, we have new desires. We no longer want to live in sin. Uh, we feel convicted, in fact, and, and we feel an uncomfortable when we sin. Uh, so we have this longing to be better. We long to uh, to get the you know um, the praise of our master and and father. Uh, we 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 long for noble things. Uh, so so those who have this hope, those who really value what is going to be done for them in the future, they will start you know, moving towards those things, even from now, there's an eagerness to become those things. On the other hand, you have some people who only ever really wanted to chase the uh, ticket to heaven. And so they have no desire whatsoever for God. They don't feel any um, need to please him. Uh, they're just happy that, you know, they managed to get hold of a ticket. So if anyone has that attitude, maybe we really need to sit down and ask ourselves, have I become a new creation on the inside? Did I ever really make that commitment where I submitted to the Lord and said, okay, Lord, now come and take over my life. If we have not done that, if we have not felt those desires, if, if I don't see any change, any renewal in me happening, then I need to ask myself, do I have the Holy Spirit living in me? Have I become, have I been made into a new creation with a new spirit? Uh, this have important life and death questions which we would need to ask ourselves if we don't see any kind of change taking place, if we don't see ourselves becoming more and more like Christ, if there is absolutely no improvement, um, you know, then uh, we would have to ask ourselves whether we have even been born again or not. Okay, so uh, that's one um, kind of a warning which we can take uh, because you know, the in the you know the next uh, uh, some some verses which are there in the later part of the chapter actually talk about that. Uh, is someone raised a hand? No, okay. All right, let's uh, move on. Uh, if if we could read uh, verse 9. Um, yeah, if someone could read out verse 9, please. Yes, Pastor. Uh, verse 9. And it reads, No one who has God as his father keeps on sinning. Because the seed planted by God remains in him. That is, he cannot continue singing because he has God as his father. Yes. Okay, so... Um, the... Um, the fake Christians, the ones you know who had gone into Gnosticism, uh, if you remember, they were the ones who were making the claim that they have been perfected by Christ. And now because Christ has perfected them, um, they are incapable of sinning anymore. So even if they do something sinful, they would say, no, no, this is not sinful. What I'm doing is not sinful because I'm incapable of sin. And so they were living in all kinds of sinful behavior and claiming that they are sinless. Okay, so uh, here uh, John is, you know, uh, pointing out that people who live like that, um, they are not really true Christians at all. Because a person who is a true Christian, he will have uh, God's seed inside him. Okay, uh, he uses this metaphor of um, of a um, of, of God being a father who has actually given birth to children. Okay, so it's just a metaphor. So obviously it, here it's not talking about physical uh, you know, birth. Um, it's talking about just the metaphor of God giving birth to children. So in that sense, metaphorically, the seed of God, the sperm of God is in the believer. Uh, and uh, we know that how did we become a new creation? It is through the Holy Spirit. That was explained to us in John chapter 3, you know, that entire passage where Nicodemus and Jesus have a conversation. So we are born of the Spirit. Uh, so um, over here, we could say uh, metaphorically, it's basically talking about the, you know, uh, in what way is the sperm of God inside us? 
basically it's the holy spirit because we have been birthed through the holy spirit so uh, those who have the holy spirit in them you know the holy spirit he um, uh, he creates a new spirit and uh, he is joined with it he lives in it and that is why we we call ourselves born again christians we no longer have a dead sinful spirit inside us a new spirit a new creation has been placed inside us by the holy spirit and the holy spirit literally resides in that people like that cannot just continue to sin uh, because the, uh, the holy spirit continues to convict them he continues to give them the desire to to change uh, he urges them uh, by re reminding them of, of all that jesus has taught you know that's what we were told right all that the G all that jesus has taught it will be um, read taught to us it will be reminded to us again and again by the holy spirit so the holy spirit constantly is our teacher and our guide and he goes on urging us and so we can never be complacent in sin and say oh i'll just continue living like this and not feel anything not feel any urge to improve that is just impossible so john is saying look at these fake christians they are saying that they are the elite they they say that they have some kind of mysterious relationship with the lord but if you look at their lifestyle they are living in sin and if you're a true believer that would not be the case you cannot continue living in sin if you are a true believer now nkjv makes this a little complicated you know because of the uh, it does not bring out that um, that present tense as a continuous present tense uh, in nkjv it just simply says whoever has been born of god does not sin for his seed remains in him and he cannot sin because he has been born of god so over here it's not just simply um, does not sin it does it means it does not continue to sin so it's a present continuous tense which is why now almost all the english versions will try to make sure that they're using that present continuous because it brings out the meaning better okay so we all sin that was made very very clear in first john chapter 1 uh, verses 7 8 9 now uh, at 10 uh, you know in, like basically in those verses it's it's made very very clear that we do sin but we don't continue to live in a lifestyle of sin there is conviction we repent we come back to him uh, we we learn the keys of living a victorious life we try to apply those and start practicing the lord helps us in our journey so all of this key goes on there's a progression taking place but a person cannot just remain at one level um, if truly the holy spirit is inside them if truly the holy spirit has made them into a new creation they cannot just stay uh, you know um, stagnant and that is why uh, nkjv even though it does not use the present continuous tense uh, that is how we need to uh, understand this verse um uh, yes uh, brother shay yeah go ahead yeah i have a question comment and observation all together uh, mm. but more of a question um i think again just to add to what you mentioned about the other translations um making this verse simply is the amplified classic says habitually so somebody who is in the habit of singing you know um that we are not supposed to be that way if truly we are from the father and you know we're god's children but again somebody else might argue and i've i've actually I've actually had these kinds of cons cons conversations. Still going back again to what we read in uh, in um, First John chapter one, and basically, let me just put it in this way: you know, if you, if you say somebody um, drives a cab or a taxi, you call that person a driver. If you say somebody um, you know fights in the ring, you call that person a boxer. And some people will now say, oh, if I sin, then I'm a sinner, you know? And then the question now comes back again to this verse we are reading now in verse nine. How then do we now reconcile the fact that uh, we are not sinners, but yes, we fall short, we sin, right? But that doesn't make us sinners because th th this these two verses, the one in first John, and then this verse that now we're reading, to some people, it could be a struggle because sometimes, again, there might be things that they are not happy about in their Christian life, 
but it's not like they want to keep doing them. You know, they just have a struggle and they are praying to God, Lord, help me. Or for some people, maybe because at some point in time, they say things they're not supposed to say, you know, they do things they're not supposed to do. And so they just categorize themselves as sinners. And then they now come to this verse and it's a bit confusing and intimidating that, okay, if I'm from God, then I'm not supposed to keep sinning. Then why is it that I keep doing this? So how then, maybe you can just explain to us and give us clarity. How then do we reconcile these verses to ensure that the believer doesn't lose their identity in Christ in spite of what they might be doing or have done, you know, in, in line with what you've been saying with us? Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor. Yes. So uh, last week when we were looking at First John chapter 2, verse 2, uh, where we looked at that, you know, the, the meaning of that term, uh, Helamos, atoning sacrifice. Uh, so First John 2, 2, it says, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and not, not for ours only, but also for the whole world. And we looked at the meaning of that word that was used over there, Helamos, um, which means atoning sacrifice. And we saw that it has two, uh, uh, two meanings. Uh, one is that it cleanses completely uh, the, the sacrifice of Jesus, which, which was performed. Uh, that sacrifice, that atoning sacrifice, completely washed and cleansed us from all unrighteousness. Um, so not only were the sins which we had committed up to that point forgiven, but even all the sins which we would be committing in the future as well, uh, you know, right up to the time that we die, um, all of those sins were wiped out, washed, cleaned. So we have been made perfectly righteous. And we saw that the other implication that that word brings out is that not only are we washed and cleansed, now God's anger is no longer against us. All he feels towards us is, um, you know, uh, that the love of a father. So yes, the love of a father will include correction. It will definitely include, you know, um, uh, removing the scales from our eyes when we have wrong doctrines and we have wrong ideas about what God's word says. The, all of that would be going on. But there is no wrath against us. There's no anger against us. All that he is doing, you know, for us will be out of love. So now we are part of his family. We have been made completely righteous. Uh, so we, we do not call ourselves sinners anymore. We call ourselves righteous in Christ, okay? Because we are clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That is our status. And 1 John 2, 2 makes that very clear. But Hebrews 10, 14 also brings out the difference between the spirit and the soul. Okay, so um, Hebrews 10, 14, uh, if we could have one, someone read out, please. Hebrews 10, 14. Hebrews 10, 14. For by a single offering, he has brought the goal for all time. Those who are being set apart for God are made holy. Oh, wow, that translation really doesn't bring out the, you know, I mean, like the word to word uh, of the thing uh, Greek. Uh, so if you were to look in our NKJV or, you know, if you were to look in our NIV, you know, the... Um, the actual the, the Greek words that are used and then try to bring out the minimal you know, translation possible. Uh, so by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. So the first portion of the verse, it's talking about how that one sacrifice has made perfect forever. The same thing which, you know, John was also trying to say. It's a atoning sacrifice for sin. Um, it's a propitiation for sin. So by that one sacrifice, we have been made completely righteous. We have been perfected. That new old sinful spirit with which we were born as a baby, that got removed. It was replaced by a new creation, by a new spirit, which is in harmony with the Lord and has the same desires that the Lord has. So uh, we have been made perfect. We are no longer sinners. But in our soul, you see, we are still in the process of being made holy. We still think um, the way we used to think earlier in many areas of life uh, because our mind has not been fully renewed. It's only the spirit 
the old spirit was taken out a brand new creation was placed inside so we are a new creation but in the mind uh, we are still having many many thought patterns which we had earlier now so it becomes our responsibility to renew our mind on a day to day basis and teach it how to be holy unto the lord how to teach it how to stay separated unto the lord not be confirmed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of the mind so every day you tell your mind to set itself apart from worldly thinking from worldly ways and set itself apart to think like god to align its thoughts with god's thoughts so it's a responsibility that we have so a careless a lazy christian can say ah that's just too difficult anyway my spirit is renewed i can en enter into heaven any time i want so why bother with the mind but no if we live like that we would live a very defeated life we would lead a very discouraged life because we will not be able to claim any of that spiritual inheritance which is ours you know because we still have this unrenewed mind just like holding us down like a weight and we can't move to higher things um we, we 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 see everything the way the world sees it we are unable to catch the 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 beauty of what the scriptures are offering and oh our lives will be so miserable because here you have on the inside the spirit which is which is crying out longing for greater things grander things for this abundant life that has been planned for it but here you have on the other hand your in unrenewed mind which still holds on to old thought patterns it's unable to grasp what the scripture is saying and oh you're so messed up so which is why you know paul says do not be confirmed to the world start moving towards a transformation by renewing of your mind on a daily basis take the word of god he says so then romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 um you know if someone could actually read out uh, romans chapter 12 verse 1 we will look at what the wording over there says uh yeah because then we'll have a clearer picture uh romans chapter 12 verse 1 if someone could read out please i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your body as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to god which is your spiritual worship yes and then verse 2 Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So we choose. We 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 consciously make a choice uh, to not act like the world, but to present our bodies and set it apart for holy things. in the process of doing that there is a transformation which takes place you know it talks about how we are not no longer you no know, we should not be confirmed to the world but be transformed and so we take god's word we act upon it and by doing god's will we prove to our mind and to the world that you see when we actually do god's will we discover that it is pleasing and perfect and good so by actually practically taking god's word standing on it believing in it and practicing it in our daily life we are proving that indeed his will is good and pleasing and perfect so as you're doing that your mind catches up it begins to understand oh god's word is superior to the thought of the world you you have to literally bring your mind in line with what your spirit already knows in your spirit you catch these things in an instant because you you know are united with the holy spirit uh, on the inside so you catch these things but your mind that's something that has to be educated so which is why he says over here in first john chapter 1 verse 9 he says um, you know uh, if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves you still have a mind that needs to be renewed so if you are under the impression that you already reached you already arrived you are really deceiving yourself he says and the truth is not in you because the truth is that you are supposed to be renewing and walking into the god into god's word at the thinking level you know your mind will and emotions they have to be brought in into alignment with god's word so he says here if we claim to be without sin we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us and then again he repeats that in verse 10 he says if we claim we have not sinned we make him out to be a liar 
and his word is not in us because the lord said that you become a new creation on the inside in your spirit he never said that he automatically waves a magic wand and makes your thinking into a brand new you know christ like thinking that's something that we are a responsibility that we are given you know it's our offering to him daily we are saying to him rather than being like the world lord i am setting myself apart to follow you to think like you to have your standards to honor you so it's a conscious offering a beautiful pleasing aroma that you're presenting to him on a daily basis how do you do that by constantly renewing your mind and saying i will act in line with god's will and prove and establish that his will is better it's pleasing it is perfect better than what the world is offering so it's it's a demonstration that of yours that you're giving of your faithfulness every day and it's very pleasing in the lord's eyes uh, so we are not sinners we are righteous but we are righteous people who are still training our training up our minds and we are doing it as sincerely as we know how with the help of the holy spirit we are not giving up even though our mind sometimes you know goes back to its old ways we say no you're going to come back in line with the will of god and we bring it back so it's it's something that we are doing on a daily basis so we would never call ourselves sinners we are righteous and we are engaged in a battle where we want to bring even this mind also in line with god so that along it's a, it's a, it can be in sync with our spirit which really loves the lord so finally when uh, one day when we see him on that day what our spirit always knew and sensed our mind also will fully grasp and on that day we will truly be like him not just in our spirit but even in our mind but while we are on the earth it's a process that we are going through i think that's a rather lengthy answer but uh, i hope it has you know really answered the question beautifully explained ma thank you so much thank you very much thank, thank you, you. Okay, so now it is nine fifty-three. So at ten three, you know, let's uh, connect back. Uh, so we will log in once again at ten three. Thank you. <laughs> 